It's not, they're singling me out. Um, so this is an example of some of the high, high level, uh, whole organism level data. Um, this is one of our favorite guinea pigs. Uh, this particular individual is me. Uh, this is just a, a few weeks ago when I was in Toronto and I can't really visit a city without getting some kind of scan. And this was a full body MRI. Um, it may not look like me because all my head and facial hair is removed uh, by the MRI process, but that is, um, I assure you, my brain. Um, and I'll just show you four quick uh, just sets of, of references. These slides will be uh, publicly available if you want to actually look at them um, in detail. But the, but the point of these reference lists is that this particular cohort, and in fact, guinea pig number one, me, has been used very extensively for four different categories. This is uh, reading data, and this so this is uh, deep haplotyping and uh, what uh, Kun Zhang's a group is referred to as ultra-accurate genome sequencing. Um, see. Oops. Oh, no, just me. And uh, and and I'll get to in a moment uh, uh, three-dimensional structures of chromosomes. So, and these are some of the I'll I'll be mentioning the graduate students and postdocs and professors that uh, have collaborated on this. And this is from mostly from Ting Lu's lab. The, the latest in 3D structure, but uh, Kun Zhang and, and others for the haplotyping. Um, so that's reading genomes, it's also used for, for writing genomes. This is a, all, this is open source uh, and some of the first development of the first um, editing methods ranging from zinc fingers, to talons to CRISPR were developed on these personal genome project cells. Um, um, and uh, transcription factors I'll tell you about uh, later. The trait data is not limited to whole organism um, MRI or fMRI, but, but everything in between, including um, uh, RNA level data, proteomics, and so forth, uh, both uh, some of it and a lot of it in C2. Um, evident, um, and then finally, we can reprogram the cells and correlate not just the human cell atlas that you can find by reading. Uh, these uh, uh, human body parts, and um, but uh, but then recapitulating those different cell types, single cell transcriptome combined with a recipe for reprogramming cells to make sure that the synthetic cells that you make, synthetic epigenetically altered cells, are as close as possible to the natural ones. And this is a, a ongoing uh, effort that I think will be very interesting. That we we won't. I will declare victory on the human cell atlas until we both have the, the list of, of um, Mac, uh, expression in every cell, but also how to make that cell and the expression of the uh, synthetic version is close. And so that synthetic version is sometimes called organoids when you put them together, multicellular structures, multi different cell types. And some of the these are some of the justifications for studying organoids. I think the one of the things most exciting to me personally is the ability of going through uh, cycles of machine learning and uh, cycles of um, com combinatoric exploration of what it takes, what transcription factors it takes to make a, a cell type. But you can also use these for, if you have variants of unknown significance, if everybody in this room gets sequenced, you're gonna find millions of differences between you and me, and uh, maybe a few of those will be alarming, uh, but of unknown significance. And so I think this is a great way to do this. And I'll show you one example of that. Um, this is a, an example uh, that Bill Poo brought to our attention uh, as, for, as a clinical geneticist. It was a cardiomyopathy of uh, this little boy. And um, even with studies where you have N of one, where you have one person, this is not about big cohorts in this particular case, uh, or even big data, uh, this is, uh, uh, N of one, but you can nevertheless prove uh, causality in a way that might even be more compelling than correlational uh, analyses because you can change one base pair in our reference PGP uh, cell line. You can change one base pair at a time, testing as many hypotheses as you want about variants of unknown significance to find the one that's most likely to, uh, to in this case, um, have 
the uh, phenotype of cardiomyopathy, of uh, cardiolipin changes, of mitochondrial changes. And in this particular case, the one that, that won, the variant of unknown significance that, that seems most compelling is, is a single base deletion in the PAS gene on the X chromosome, which seems like a, you know, that's a good place to look for a, uh, for a male that, that uh, is, um, has the unfortunate uh, uh, situation of having only one X chromosome. Um, all of us do, but this one also had a mutation in the TAS protein. So anyway, we changed that with CRISPR and then uh, sequenced the entire genome, of course, to, if you change one base pair, you need to sequence all six billion to make sure you haven't changed anything else. This is, this is where we are with sequencing now, it's, it's so trivial to do that. And, uh, and then you can show there's nothing off target and what's on target is exactly one base pair. You can do this because you have stem cell clones. And then you, after doing genetic manipulation of stem cells, you do epigenetic manipulation to get uh, a variety of different cell, uh, sorry, uh, these organoids. Um, in this case, uh, cardiac tissue that does uh, sort of one cycle per second beating, uh, heart-like beating, and one base pair. Uh, so, that, so normal control is on the far left, and the one uh, over from that is changing one base pair. Uh, and and all of the phenotypes I mentioned are, are, are shared in this, and it can be restored by adding uh, messenger RNA for the TAS protein, which completes as close as we get to proof of cause and effect for this kind of variant unknown significance. And I said I use CRISPR for that, and I, I should be a cheerleader for the CRISPR team, uh, and I am occasionally, but uh, I also feel this is my obligation to, to say that it is just a, a point along a curve it is not that different from previous methods, all of which are still alive and healthy, about eight different ways of editing. Um, and there are many of them are making their way in clinical trials. CRISPR is not that, it's not. Next gen sequencing is 10 million times better. CRISPR is about four times better than some of the competition. And for some things, and I'll show you an example in a moment, it, it's actually worse. Um, but I don't need to belabor all these. So suffice it to say that I have warned you that CRISPR is not perfect, and we are trying to make it better. Here's an example of a CRISPR-free um, experiment. This is not done with PGP cells. It's done with a microorganism. But it shows where we're going with PGP cells in a second. These open access shows. We feel that we can make any organism, any cell, any whole organism resistant to all viruses simultaneously by one uh, simple strategy. It is not a single mutation, but it is a single strategy, which is changing one or more codons genome-wide in such a way that the host cell for the would-be virus is completely normal, um, but the virus is broken in every single gene in multiple ways. And, uh, we, we, and we've shown that this is uh, uh, very close um, in one organism, uh, E. coli, where 321 changes makes it resistant to four out of six viruses, and we're and that's just changing one code on, and we're well on our way to doing 62,000 edits in one genome, one cell, simultaneously um, to make it resistant to all viruses, all natural viruses, including ones we've never even seen before. I think this is a very profound concept, and we're applying it not just to um, a variety of industrial microorganisms like this, but to plants and animals and humans. And this is the roadmap, our computational roadmap for. Uh, uh, altering the human genome uh, in a similar way. The simplest one is the one at the top where we're changing um, the stop codons as we did before. It's, it's still 4,000 edits simultaneously, which is quite a few. Um, but then there are other ones that involve even more on the order of more than 80,000 edits. So we need obviously some new way of editing and I'll get to that a little later. One of the things that we would like to do both with those, those cells, which will be multivirus resistant and a variety of other cells is to have a, sometimes called allogeneic or universal uh, transplants. Since the dawn of transplantation, uh, you've had to match the HLA types uh, just to compatibility, uh, but that is um, fading. Uh, the new possibilities are happening in particular to altering um, uh, beta-2 microglobulin and replacing it with uh, HLA-E um, can result in a broad acceptance of uh, these allogeneric or, or universal donors. In this, in the most common uh, clinical trial right now, and the, probably the best example of using editing methods, both uh, CRISPR 
talons and zinc fingers have all been used for this is these CAR T cells, but making them universal. CAR T is just recombinant DNA, but universality requires some subtraction of all of the addition and these zinc fingers, talons and CRISPR are good at that subtraction. And here's one of the first patients to uh, benefit from this CAR T uh, therapy on um, B cell cancers. Taking this one step further, and, and, uh, and one of our first examples of radical uh, editing is, uh, is humanizing pigs. Here we probably have to change about 100 uh, uh, mutations to improve the immune function, the compatibility of the sugars, complement clotting, and so forth. The first thing we wanted to overcome was 20 years and $2 billion uh, had been focused on this problem. And, and the field had faded uh, because of fear of these endogenous retroviruses, which are present in every organ of every pig that would be going into a immune suppressed organ recipient, making a, paving the way for a, what could be an unfortunate zoonotic disease that evolves in the patient. So we wanted to avoid that. But we were intimidated by changing 62 genes at once with CRISPR because our, our record up to that point was two genes at once which is a big difference. And, uh, but we figured that we, if we didn't try, we would certainly surely fail. And so we tried and, and embarrassingly, it was only 14 days later uh, that we succeeded, um, 14 days mostly in the incubator, not actually hands-on uh, experiments. So, that, so this has gone on to uh, uh, make uh, these baby pigs, uh, and now they're adult pigs that are breeding and we're beginning um, uh, preclinical non-human primate uh, trials in collaboration with the MGH. What's cool about engineering organs is it allows us to think um, brought more broadly about what we want uh, in our in organ transplants and things that would be very hard to justify a clinical trial to make a, a healthy adult human uh, resistant to pathogens, cancer, senescence, immunity, cryopreservation, and so forth, um, is easier to justify when you're, putting, when you're trying to develop a, an organ for transplant. If you're putting a liver into a patient with hepatitis, you don't want the new liver to get the same thing the old liver got. And so you want it to be pathogen resistant. And I laid out one way of making it multivirus resistant, but, um, but another opportunity is that with animal, the pigs, tend not to get uh, many uh, human-specific diseases like um, uh, HIV and hepatitis and so forth. And so, they, uh, so that's, that's an interesting uh, beginning, but we, can, we know how to protect mice from cancer, senescence, uh, and, and so forth. And here's three uh, animals that survive extreme cryopreservation as well, which inspire us to try to get that to work for, for storing the organs. These are uh, we have a, a, a finally, after a few years of work, we have finally made a, a full human transcription factor library. This is uh, an interesting uh, computational task. It's still ongoing. We we now have it, at least one expression clone for every um, thing that might even look like a, a DNA binding protein in the human genome. Um, but we're now trying to make all the splice variants on that. Uh, so we have 1,748 open reading expression clones already, and these will be distributed um, in open access, uh, inexpensive at cost through this nonprofit ad gene. And then the, these are used, uh, here is showing the stem cells from PG, these again, these open PGP cells. Uh, on, the, on the left, they're turning into endothelial cells, kind of tiling the surface. And on the right, they're turning in these long spindle shapes, drawn out with one axon and one dendrite, exactly bipolar and, and excitatory. So going to one particular neuron type, we can make a variety of different neuron types. In fact, it seems like we can make almost any cell type. These are done in separate uh, cultures, so you can see the morphological changes over time. But we'd really like to do them together, so we have developed a way to do them together. You can't do it by just programming the media. The media is shared, and if you want five different cell types, you need to program each of them to respond differently to the same media. And that's what we've done with these transcription factors. And you just mix endothelial cells with, with neuronal progenitors and let them differentiate. They'll separate like oil and water. But if they differentiate together, they make this nice interspersed pattern. You see here for the red are the endothelial cells stained with VE cadherin. 
what's significant about that is they not only, um, and th this is done in collaboration with uh, Mark Scott and Jennifer Lewis's lab, but they not only intersperse like they would normally wouldn't, um, but they, uh, the, here the red is interspersed with the blue uh, neuronal nuclei, um, but they form tubules. They spontaneously form the tubules you would expect of capillaries. And this may seem a little dense to you, but it actually in your brain, probably, uh, there's about one capillary per neuron. You have 86 billion neurons, you have a similar number of capillaries. So it's about the right density. And in the electron micrograph, you can, you can see uh, a nice rim of very thin endothelial cells lining up five micron um, lumen, which is exactly what you need for transporting blood. Another example uh, in this uh, EGP open source uh, reprogramming of cells, we have a uh, an uh, intimate connection between the ligand endocytes, which wrap, you, wrap the axons in myelin when it's going through the white matter as opposed to the gray matter, and allows the, the, the signals to go very fast. So we reproduce this in, uh, in, our, in growing our, our mini brains in the lab so that we can have myelinated, and this is a good, hopefully a good model for multiple sclerosis and other demyelinating diseases. And I just want to say that we, in addition to these electron micrographs and, and, uh, and simple protein staining, we want to actually under, make sure every protein, every RNA, DNA, and protein is in the right place in the right amount. Um, and so to do that, we really need a three-dimensional image um, where every pixel, every voxel in the image is annotated as to what molecules that position. And it may seem like, uh, like everything else I say, a pipe dream, but here's an example of a single cell where every dot is a single RNA molecule where we're doing next-gen sequencing, but in situ, so we're not throwing away the three-dimensional coordinates. The computer then reads that and then re regurgitates it in these uh, uh, vectors of, of uh, let me just do that one more time. So these, each of these dots, it has four colors, GATC, and uh, you see at first the dots don't change position, just the colors change, and then you can recapitulate the barcode this infers natural sequence of a tag from each RNA. And we can do this not only for RNA, but for DNA and protein, as I'll show you just in a moment. This is the DNA. This is mostly work from uh, Ting Wu's lab and Peng Yin's lab, um, where we they start uh, on one point in one chromosome and can essentially computationally and, and experimentally walk along it to an adjacent position on now there are two chromosomes 19s because like I said, we're all diploid, except for the, the original human genome project, which found a hu haploid human somehow. Um, and then a third uh, walk and you're just walking along the chromosome. Now you start picking up two more chromosomes because you want this to be efficient. In principle, you can sequence all the, you can, uh, all the chromosomes simultaneously. This is showing three at once and marching along step-by-step, step, um, tracing the three-dimensional structure um, at, uh, at, at super resolution, this can be done at, at close to uh, uh, 12 nanometer precision. Another example of super resolution in the third of our trifecta of macromolecules, you can, any omics you like, just add in situ to the name and then it's even cooler omics. Uh, and so this is proteomics with in situ. And this is done by reducing a protein problem to an antibody problem to a nucleic, a nucleic acid label antibody. So each of these little Y-shaped molecules is labeled with a short oligonucleotide, and then that oligonucleotide allows a new way of doing uh, super resolution, which uh, Peng Yin uh, developed, and, and our joint student, uh, Yu Wang here, pictured, uh, uh, de developed this further and, and applied it specifically here to synapses, where we really need the super resolution. So in order to determine the directionality going from presynaptic to postsynaptic and, the, and to determine whether it's inhibitory, excitatory synapses, this is important for understanding the, the connectome of the, of the brain, the, the uh, roughly 1,000 times as many synapses as there are 86 billion neurons. And so you can see each of these little white vectors uh, is pointing out the, this is summarizing the four different, in this case, uh, eight different antibodies, four of them uh, contribute to our understanding of the synapse. And then, uh, and then finally, we have a, a, a machine learning uh, program, a, a few of them, but here's one that we use on developing one of the main gene therapy vectors, the viral, vector, viral pro, 
protein coat or adeno associated virus. Here are four naturally occurring ones that differ by hundreds of amino acids from one another down at the bottom. But what we would like to be able to do is computationally uh, not only bridge these hundreds of amino acid differences, but go off into, into sequence space that has never been explored before, looking for new viruses that will have lower innate immunity, lower acquired humoral immunity, and new tissue tropism so we can more uh, accurately target uh, different uh, cells in the body. And we have uh, made progress on all of those. Um, we have very low innate immunity. Um, and we've gone through this loop so of machine learning making synthesizing, not just in the computer, but in actuality, over 220,000 different um, viral vectors and testing them. So just, I, I want to have a lively discussion with the time that's left. Uh, th these are the sort of resources we're talking about. It's all done in, uh, in an ex extreme form of open uh, source um, where real uh, 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 humans uh, have their medical records tied to all these um, new cutting edge technologies for in situ DNA, RNA, protein um, structure and uh, uh, ways of, of testing uh, various unknown significance and new therapies. I've mentioned some of these people along the way, but I'm particularly indebted to my colleagues uh, Ed Boyd and Jennifer Lewis, Ting Wu, Conrad Cording, and Bruce Sheng. So thank you very much. Questions? Yes. How much do you see um, a normally growing cell, a mammalian cell growing in culture? If you query it by any of these omics methods, uh, how much does it change over time? The relevance is really biologics or any of the proteins that are produced. Um, right. So uh, uh, hardly at all, or quite a bit, depending on your point of view. And I'll, I'll be more quantitative. So uh, if you, uh, probably one of the most studied examples of this, of somatic variation, uh, especially when you take it out of the, the body, is in trying to establish these pluripotent lines. And in doing that, you get both epigenetic and genetic changes. There's a great deal of pressure on them to replicate. And in fact, this is, this is one of the problems that we, that we face when we're trying to make uh, stem cell therapies or cell therapies like the, the, the CAR T cell therapy that I talked about. A couple of companies I'm working with, you know, recently brought to my attention how hard it is to scale up. In some cases, they're trying to scale up to 10 to the 11th, almost a trillion cells. And in the process of doing that, you select for cells that have proliferative capabilities that are not what you want, uh, putting it back into a patient. So. So there is all, uh, almost all stem cell lines have been established have some evidence that they've, they've uh, mutated. Some of the mutations look pretty benign. Now, what you can do is you can take a lot of clones and then you can sequence them all. Um, but then you also have to deal with epigenetic mutations. So I think that that's why the single cell or in situ transcriptomes is a good, because um, the epigenetics is quite heritable on a cell level, even if it's not. Um, generation to generation, so that's a good point. Um, but these are the tools to do it with, and I think with clones, you can you can do quite a bit. Also, the closer you get to organoids that re replicate the in vivo situation, the more likely you're gonna be, have something where there's less pressure on it to uh, replicate in an abnormal way. The, 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 well, so you've got, uh, so you, you, uh, in the in the best case scenario, even you've got um, some mutations and epi mutations, meaning uh, you've got uh, just random events that occur that would get lost in the wash of ten to the eleven cells because there'd be, you know, even if each of the ten to the eleven cells had its own mutation, that's not too bad. But if one of them occurs early in the process and it has proliferative capability and, and you have it in the wrong environment where you're just having, pre so a lot of these in culture environments have been misguided. They've been had things like they have, uh, you know, oxygen concentrations of 21%, which sounds normal, 
until you go look inside your body and it's, you're, you're breathing 21%, but inside your body is closer to 3%. That's just one example. There are other examples where you're giving it the wrong growth factors or the lack of a cellular matrix. There's, so these are the tools we need to find out what constitutes a normal environment for, for expanding cells, both for research and clinical purposes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so the question is uh, about the in situ proteomics. Uh, the allele exchange is one of the three ways we do super resolution. It was developed by, in Hung Yun's lab. The other two ways are expansion microscopy, right, Boyden's group, and storm type uh, uh, and, and other super resolution methods that are purely based on blinking or, or um, uh, uh, optical tricks. Um, the exchange method. Uh, it is barcoding in the sense that the piece of the piece of DNA that labels the antibodies uh, can be any DNA you want. It is a barcode. You want to make it, you know, a good hamming distance away from any of the other barcodes. But since it's completely synthetic, it's entirely within your control. The bigger specificity problem is the antibody problem. But I would maintain that doing multiple antibodies, and this is a speculation. We haven't proven it yet. But but if you do multiple antibodies simultaneously, at first you say, oh, that's just going to raise the background. But in fact, uh, if you have multiple proteins that are, say, family members or closely related, uh, if you just use one antibody, after it's done doing its job, uh, the excess antibodies will bind to all the other ones that are closely related. But if you have a competition, you've got a chance for the, the right antibody getting there first and blocking it sterically. So I'm really looking forward to doing antibodies the same way we do RNA. Um, but that's a whole other story is how we generate all those high quality antibodies, which is not, uh, anyway. Other questions? Anybody know of a, of a good open source uh, resource uh, for human genetics that I'm not aware of? Anyway, you're all welcome to use this one. It's, uh, it's, it's your resource, uh, so please use it. it and anything that's missing from it, we try to have at least a sample of every kind of data that you would want, every kind of instrument, every cutting edge, bleeding edge, misguided technology we use on at least some of the individuals in this cohort. Um, if there's a particular uh, ancestry group we're missing, please let us know. Uh, the, the latest, almost all of the, the nations that are involved here, we did not have to twist their arm, they came to us, but if there is an arm that we need to twist, let us know. Yes. So the number of people in the PGP is a soft number because it, var it varies from location to location what they consider in, uh, and we're not we're not a, a central management with the strong rules. The, the only real rule we have is they have to share the data fully openly, not not with any requirement for proof of researcher status. Um, it's on the order of uh, ten thousand or so worldwide. Um, a very few of those have high quality whole genome sequence, but that's not, uh, it's not the only criteria for being uh, included in these. And, it, and if these, if the latest entrants are, are serious, they're talking about doing millions of genomes in it. And if the plan for getting the, uh, giving people their genome for free or for paying them $500, I'm surprised nobody asked the question of how we're gonna make money giving away genomes for $500 um, incentive. But anyway, if that works out, we should have a billion genomes, uh, um, at least in, in a form that they could donate them. And it's another matter of whether they will want to or not. I mean, right now they don't want to get them, much less donate them. But yeah. One of the key things that we've seen over the past uh, year have been some key changes in data privacy laws and yeah. issues around uh, personal privacy. <laughs> So we think about you know, personal data, everybody was willing to give their data away to Facebook, or, you know, to, to Twitter and whatnot, but now we're seeing a pullback there. What do you think the implications are when we look at genetic data? Right. Well, I think we already had a higher, uh, higher awareness and concern about genetic data than we ever had about the Facebook data. Um, and so it, in a certain sense, Facebook's just catching up with our genetic concerns. Even though I've been champion of the Personal Genome Project, all this time I've also been 
trying to develop technologies that allow us to have like hyper uh, security. Um, you know, one of the one of the first uh, um, uh, genomes we delivered through GNOME um, was on a, a, a flash drive that was self-destruct if you've entered your password wrong. Uh, for example, uh, that was many years. That was 2007. But um, but now what we're doing in nebula genomics is using uh, homomorphic encryption or possibly other encryptions together with blockchain, so that the user the patient has their own genome, nobody else has their genome, nobody ever has their genome. Um, if you want to ask a question about it, you go um, uh, through the blockchain as a trans transaction monitoring. Um, so in a way, we want to um, develop the most trustworthy uh, method available. We don't want to say that it's going to be perfect. I mean, I think it's much better than, than it was, um, and we, we try to make it perfect. But it's important to communicate clearly um, that there. Uh, but certainly, it's a very different uh, business model than saying, "Oh, your data is at company X, and they're going to sell it to company Y and Z um, without checking with you." I think this is something that puts it back in your hands. This is one of the things you asked about. Yeah. There's a new company in the information called Strata Oncology. Yeah. The principle here is the patient gets sequenced, the human patient and the germline get sequenced, and the payment will come from the pharmaceutical company looking for targets for which their drugs will be useful. Yep. Getting them out from patients, which yep. are hard to come by. Right. That's, yep. that's, that's exactly what we're trying to do with Nebula, except for not just for cancers, but for other things as well. But in addition to that model, which I think is is well on good foundation, because pharma companies are always looking for good cohorts, and this will just as another way of getting an expensive uh, one. But I think that's a 15-year payoff. In other words, there's the cohorts phase, there's the research genomics phase, and there's the the drug development phase. 15 years optimistically. But another they have drugs that are looking for targets. Then that's even that's even faster than yeah. But but the other model is uh, is carrier status, where I think you can get a two-year return on investment if you can do matchmaking, as is done with Dorius Jareem and uh, and Tay-Sachs. You generalize that model, you can get uh, payers can, can save millions of dollars on the five percent of the population, which is severely affected. So those are essentially two two or three business models that, that allow you to pay it forward five hundred dollars to everybody who wants it. And I think that's a much easier sell. And to try to get everybody educated to the point where they understand that they have a five, a uh, ninety-five percent chance of getting a blank report for their genome. And what I just paid nine hundred ninety-nine dollars for a blank report. You know, that's, that's not that's not good Twitter. <clears throat> yeah, back there. I I fill my car. Yeah. Get the um, kid speed up the one in a in a while. Yeah, you're paying two hundred dollars for that. I pay them. Yes. But, but in this new model, you will get paid five hundred dollars. Because I'm going to save uh, several million dollars if you avoid having a child that that costs the healthcare system two million dollars, which is which is about five percent of children born with very severe um Mendelian diseases and those those have been uh avoided in the in the case of Tay Sachs by matchmaking. So I'm interested in this program. I want to enroll so I go to the nebula, sign yeah. up and what's the process? Um yeah you 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 download software for matchmaking uh prove that you're going to use it and uh and it and and then um and then you get your genome sequence you keep your genome um, but over the blockchain, you find people in your social network that are the correct sex and age, and et cetera. And then a certain fraction of those are, are randomly rejected, and another fraction are rejected because they have the same carrier status you do for serious diseases. And so you might lower your, your percentage available from 100% to 90%. Yeah, that's, that's the model. Any, 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 if anybody knows any uh, insurance companies or uh, 
uh, health, uh, employment health that wants to discuss this model. I, I, that's what I'm doing right now is I'm talking to a lot of them to, to see what's, what's wrong with this model, if anything. Yeah, yes, that's top, top on the list. Um, thank you. Yeah. 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 Is that that's not the, that's not the point. Uh, I, I think we'd like to avoid that. Uh, uh, what we just want is some evidence that they're using this, the the, sof the software, the app, um, to uh, in, in some way that will uh, benefit the the uh, payer. Um, but the payer doesn't get their genome. Nobody gets their genome uh, other than a tiny amount of transaction uh, with other people with whom they're thinking of dating or marrying, you know, and even they don't get the genome. In fact, even the person doesn't need to see their own genome uh, in order for this to work. Um, if, you, if you really don't want to know anything at all about your genome, this whole thing can still work, um, which I think is fascinating. Um, of course, I want to know my genome, but I think some people don't. But even there, if, or maybe you want to know part of your genome, you just want to know things that are highly actionable in forms of actionability that you're comfortable with. So for example, if you don't like surgery, you don't like anesthesia, fine, those, the, you take those off the actionability list. It greatly reduces the actionability list. But the most actionable thing I think is, is matchmaking. I think it's been greatly ignored and undervalued uh, in every community, insurance community, the, the, the data community, the informatics community. It's just really, it, it's a huge opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> right. It's a it's a real icebreaker to say that yeah we're we're compatible 